23, Acts chapter 23, from danger to danger. Some time ago, a zoo in North Yorkshire, must have been some time ago because it's not there anymore. Today, if you go, it's no longer a zoo, it's Flamingo Land. But when it was a zoo, they had a problem. And the problem was this, that the monkeys were stealing things off the tourists, off the people who were visiting the zoo. And the favorite item that the monkeys stole was spectacles, people's eyeglasses. And when they investigated why, the reason was simple. People were leaning over to read a sign, and as they leant over to read the sign, so the monkeys grabbed their glasses. And no prizes for guessing. The sign said this, beware, these monkeys steal spectacles. <laughs> a more serious version on the same line, Glenn Cunningham in Reader's Digest says that he visited the African Victoria Falls. And those falls produce a heavy mist. And the mist is often heavy that it impairs a person's vision. While he was walking along a path on the skirts of the gorge of the Zambezi River, he noticed a sign that he couldn't make out in the midst. So he got closer and closer and closer to it. When he got up close and was able to read the sign, it said this, danger, crumbling edge. From danger to danger. Now, most of us wouldn't choose to put ourselves in a dangerous situation. We might like, you know, uh, Glenn Ch Cunningham there, get in a dangerous situation by accident, but most of us wouldn't choose to. Some people do. For example, the most dangerous sport in the world is called base jumping. Base jumping. When you jump off a cliff or a mountaintop or a, a skyscraper, with just a hand glider or parachute, and you hope it opens or gives you the protection you need. Base jumping. Some people put themselves in danger deliberately. Considered the most dangerous sport, boxing. If you are hit in the head by someone who is 16 to 20 stone, a heavyweight boxer, repeatedly, it's not going to do you much good. It is a dangerous sport, yet thousands of people, if not millions of people around the world, choose to partake in it. And this one, of course, racing, racing. doesn't matter if it's a car, a superbike, anything that goes around a racetrack at 200 miles an hour is life-threatening, is life-threatening. But like I say, most of us wouldn't willingly put ourselves in a dangerous situation. But of course, many Christians around the world have no choice. The moment you publicly declare your faith in Jesus, you stick your neck out and you may get it where the chicken got the chopper. Open Doors, one of the charities that we support and, and learn about, 11 Christians every day are martyred for their faith around the world. 11 Christians. But millions are persecuted for their faith every day. Imprisoned, beaten, violently attacked, churches destroyed for no other reason than following Jesus. And even in this country, I'm going to dash off today and, and go up to Hyde Park where I visit regularly. I uh, haven't been for two weeks and I won't be there for another two weeks. So I'm going to zoom off and make the most of it. But there's a Somali man who came up to us a few weeks ago, just a young guy in his 20s. He said, can you pray for me? He said, last week I became a Christian, but nobody knows. For the first time, I went to a church this morning. He said, if my parents find out, I'll be sent back to Somalia. And there I will experience trouble and danger. And trouble with a capital T. And danger with a capital D. So a lot of people experience danger simply for naming Jesus and following him in an open and in a public way. Now, in this chapter of the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul is again in a dangerous situation. You know, the, the, the final part of the book of Acts is simple, from Jerusalem to Rome. From Jerusalem to Rome. And how God gets the Apostle Paul there. In today's passage, there are no major doctrines. It's narrative. It's story. 
I don't know if you're into the, the, the movies or the old ones, but Alfred Hitchcock made over 50 films, one of the great directors of movies, one of the most influential figures of cinema. Now, not a lot of people know this, but if you watch a Hitchcock film, maybe The Birds, Psycho, if you watch a Hitchcock, yeah, pleasant ones they are, a Hitchcock thriller, he's always there at some stage in the film. He always makes an appearance. It may be a street scene and he's seen cross, walking across the zebra crossing just for two seconds. It may be in a cafe and he orders a cup of coffee in the background. But he's always there, but he's not prominent in the movie. Now, although there are no major doctrines taught in this chapter or discussed, like Hitchcock, if you look hard enough, they're there in the background. For example, verse 6 talks about the resurrection of the dead. It doesn't explain it, but it mentions it. Verse 11 to 15 talk about the providence, the leading and the guiding of God, arranging circumstances. So like Hitchcock, God is at work, but he's in the background, not in the forefront of the story. And we're going to split the story into three major headings. And because it's narrative, we'll quickly skip through them, and then we'll just draw a conclusion. So heading number one, Paul and the council. That's verses 1 to 11. Verses 1 to 11. And because it's narrative, I'm going to ask Penny just to read it to us one more time. So the words will be on the screen. Let's remind ourselves. So chapter 23, verse 1. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, how dare you insult God's high priest? Paul replied, Oh, brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest, for it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, my brothers, I am a Pharisee, descended from Pharisees. I stand on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees Sadducees say that there is no resurrection and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees believe in all these things. There was a great uproar, and the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they said. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him back into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Thank you. Paul and the council. I don't know if you like councils and bureaucracy. Uh, One newspaper editor fell out with his local council, and so he put a headline on the front of his paper that said this, Half the city council are crooks. Half the city council are crooks. Well, it caused uproar. They were not best pleased. They demanded an apology. So the next day, his newspaper read this. Half the city council aren't crooks. Well, the council mentioned here is not a civil one. It's not political. It's a religious council. A religious council. The Sanhedrin, an organized Jewish council of 70 men. 70 men. This was the supreme court of Israel. Although the Romans ruled... They delegated power still to these people, but they limited their power. 
So they couldn't kill anyone. But they were still the religious mafia, the religious politicians. You mess with them at great cost. And there are four things in this section. Let me tell you what they are briefly. First, the Apostle Paul is punched in the mouth. Second, the Apostle Paul refuses to recognize and Ananias the high priest. Third, the Sanhedrin is divided. And then fourth, the Lord speaks to Paul. So those are the four elements in this first section, Paul and the council. Let's skip through them quickly. First of all, the high priest Ananias commanded that Paul be punched in the mouth, verse 2. What was his crime? Well, verse 1 tells us. Paul says, I stand here in all good conscience before God. And they didn't like that. So what did they do? They punch him. That reaction of Ananias tells you his style of ruling. Forget whether a man is innocent or not. If I don't like him or I don't like his tone of voice or I don't like the answer he gives, hit him. Let him know who's boss. And history records that Ananias was a nasty bit of work. The ancient Jewish historian Josephus tells us that he stole the tithes that belonged to the priests. And according to the scholar F.F. F. Bruce, he had no problem using violence and assassination to further his interests. Isn't it amazing how religion and violence often go hand in glove? That's why we're not called to be religious. We're called to be followers of Christ. Big difference. Secondly, the Apostle Paul did not recognize Ananias the high priest. Verse 4. How dare you, they say to him. How dare you insult the high priest? Now, one reason might be because at different sections of the court, they wore different clothing. And as this court was quickly gathered, the high priest might not have his robes on. So Paul didn't know one from another. It may be that Paul's eyesight was really bad. We're told elsewhere, especially in Galatians, Galatians 4.15 and Galatians verse 6.11, Paul's thorn in the flesh may have been bad eyesight. And so uh, he couldn't see who the high priest was. He could only hear and, and, and get a blurred vision. But either way, he doesn't recognize him, and, when he, uh, and so he, he insults him. Maybe, though, he doesn't realize he's the high priest because of his actions. He's not acting like a high priest. says that, uh, where is it? Um, yeah, Deuteronomy 25, verse 1 to 2 says that only a man found guilty can be beaten. And this man's ordered an innocent man, a man who's yet to be tried, to be punched and beaten. So he's not acting according to his position. So there may be lots of reasons Paul doesn't recognize him. But when Paul is told this is the high priest, he apologizes. He might not like the man, but he respects the position. He respects the office. A bit like in the army. You might not like your sergeant major, but you respect the, you respect the fact he's got stripes on his arm, and you therefore obey him. You respect the position if you can't respect the man. Thirdly, the Sanhedrin are divided, verse 6 to 10. The Apostle Paul is so wise. He weighs up the situation and in a few words he's able to divide up the court so they're fighting each other and not fighting against him. The Sanhedrin was made up of Sadducees and Pharisees, two religious groups, two types of people. Just like today you might have Catholics and Protestants. In Islam you have Shia and Sunni Muslims, people who have different ideas. And when you get them together sometimes they can be quite argumentative. And you, in Judaism, you had the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees did not believe in the supernatural. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead, for example. Uh, but the Pharisees did. So Paul says to those on, who, who, who share a common belief, he says, look, he said, I'm on trial. You better be careful. You're going to be joining me soon because I believe exactly what you believe. So if they condemn me, you're next. So they say, whoa, 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 what's going on here? He's one of us. And they stand up to defend him. And there's an argument. And they're divided amongst themselves. And then in verse 11, Paul is taken away. And the Lord spoke to Paul. Gave him a word of encouragement. Now, I've been a Christian for many, 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 many years. Uh, just knocked up another one, as some of you know. So, you know, from a mature position as a believer. Do you know, in all my time as a Christian, 
I have never heard the audible voice of God. I couldn't write verse 11. The Lord came next to me and spoke to me. It's never happened. And for most Christians, it never will. God does speak today, and he speaks today in a variety of ways. Clearest of all, through his word, the Bible. No Christian doubts, whatever their background, whatever their denomination, that God speaks through his word. That's the number one thing we all agree on. God speaks clearly, it's there in black and white, through his word. That's why we study it week by week. That's why we encourage folks to read it in their homes day by day. Secondly, he speaks through other people. One of the ways God has shaped my life is when I've been in the congregation and people have spoken to me through a sermon and God's helped shape my life and brought conviction and brought challenge. That's why it's important we meet together regularly. And I'll tell you, as a preacher, I've gone with what I believe is a word from the Lord and you turn up and you think, well, there's no one here to hear it. Who's this for, Lord? Thirdly, he speaks through circumstances and through our conscience. Through circumstances and through our conscience. And other Christians will say God may speak through other ways, through dreams, whatever. I'm not disagreeing, I'm not promoting that. But I think the clearest ways where we're all in common agreement, he speaks through his word, he speaks through other Christians, he speaks through preachers and teachers, and he speaks through circumstances and he speaks through our conscience. We know what's right, we know what's wrong at times. But these are unusual circumstances, and that's why God reveals himself to Paul in an unusual way. Remember, uh, for the, the Apostle Paul, he's soon to be martyred. He's going to be killed for his faith. He's going to stand before intimidating figures, and uh, he needs extra courage that many of us will never be in that situation will need. So God speaks to him, encourages him in a special way. And also the book of Acts is a transition period in the church. Things happen in the book of Acts that were unusual, not the everyday. We don't get our theology from the book of Acts. We get our theology from the Gospels and the letters. Any theology in the book of Acts is true, but it's a transition period. Our theology comes from the letters and the Gospels not from the book of Acts. So that's why I think God speaks to Paul in this unusual way, by drawing alongside him. And he will do that in various ways, to give him courage, to give him courage for what he's about to face. So first of all, Paul and the council. Secondly, Paul and the conspirators, verses 12 to 22. Penny, can you read it for us again? So chapter 23 and verse 12. The next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they'd killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and said, We've taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we've killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul, then Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul the prisoner sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and asked, What is it you want to tell me? He said, some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They've taken an oath not to eat or drink until they've killed him. They're ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man with this warning. Don't tell anyone that you've reported this to me. Thank you. Paul and the conspirators. Again, two things really in this chapter. 
The Jews planned to kill Paul, verses 12 to 15, and the plot was discovered, verses 16 to 22. So first of all, the Jews planned to kill Paul. I wonder how many of you recognize the name Francis Tresham. Francis Tresham. He was part of the gang of traitors uh, alongside Guy Fawkes, who on November the 5th, 1605, 13 young men planned to blow up the houses of Parliament. They rented out a house next to the houses of Parliament. They dug a tunnel. Into that tunnel, they placed 36 barrels, 1.5 tons of gunpowder. One of the group members, called Francis Tresham, panicked a bit. And he sent an anonymous letter to his brother-in-law, Law, his brother-in-law, Lord Montagle. The letter told him, do not attend Parliament on November the 5th. And as a result of that letter, a plot was discovered and the politicians were saved. The plot was foiled and eventually Guy Fawkes and his crew were tried and hanged. And of course, every November the 5th in the UK, we still celebrate that occasion. People still have bonfires and fireworks are still let off in memory of Guy Fawkes and the Houses of Parliament not being blown up. These days, we'd probably all be there with a match to help them, wouldn't we? But of course we wouldn't, of course we wouldn't. Now, no terrorist, no traitor wants to be found out. But in these verses, that's exactly what happens. Verses 12 to 14, 40 Jews band together. They have an oath to kill Paul. They are serious. You know it's serious when men say we're not going to eat till we accomplish something. You know, we, like, we think about food every half an hour, don't we, guys? But they say we're not going to eat again until Paul is dead. What makes the plan even worse is in verse 14 and 15, they go to the chief priests, the elders, the people who should be models of truth, who should have standards of honesty, and compassion and love and they get permission from they involve them in the plot totally corrupt totally corrupt and they go along with this evil plan to kill Paul we'll ambush him and we'll kill him when he's escorted to the courtroom so that's the first part the Jews plan to kill Paul the second part verse 16 to 22 the plot was discovered now, my wife, Penny, is always shouting at me these words. You're not listening to me, are you? And I think, what a strange way to start a conversation. That's what I say, Alan. What a strange way to start a conversation. <laughs> now, in these verses, we have someone who was good at listening. Good at listening. The nephew of the Apostle Paul. And, and just as a side note, we get more information about the family of Paul in these verses than anywhere else in the Bible. We know he has a sister, later, we know he has a sister, we know he's got a nephew, and we're even told his own father was a Pharisee. And Paul kept in the family business, and he became a family. So we learn a little bit about Paul's background in verse 16. That is the narrative. The nephew hears of the ambush plot. He goes to Paul in the barracks, tells him what he's heard. Paul sends him to the Roman commander, and as a result, they all live happily. Well, they don't, but they go on to safety till the next instalment or episode. So Paul is rescued. The plot is foiled. And then we have this third part, Paul and the captain, verses 23 to 35. Again, let's just read it together. So chapter 23 and verse 23. Then he called two of his centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Provide horses for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. And he wrote a letter as follows. Claudius Lysias to his excellency, Governor Felix, greetings. 
This man was seized by the Jews and they were about to kill him, but I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned he is a Roman citizen. I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to do with questions about their law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. So the soldiers carrying out their orders took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Antipatris. The next day, they let the cavalry go on with him while they returned to the barracks. When the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from. And learning that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. And then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. Thank you. So this last part of the story, the narrative, Paul and the captain, verses 23 to 35. And again, three little bits are highlighted in the narrative. First, The commander has two centurions prepare to take Paul to Rome, verses 23 and 24. Second, the commander writes a letter to Felix, 25 to 30. And then third, Paul was taken to Caesarea and presented to Felix. So let's just focus in on two of them as we conclude. The commander had two centurions prepare to take Paul, verses 23 and 24. A lot of organization instantly takes place. 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen. And this happened at the third hour of the night to get Paul from danger to safety. Second, the commander wrote a letter to Felix. He summarizes the situation of Paul that we've read about several times. He understands, he inquires where Paul's from. Cilicia, and uh, he agreed to hear Paul when his accusers arrived, and Paul is taken to Herod's Praetorium. So it's very much narrative. Paul, being a Roman citizen, gets Roman protection. Most prisoners wouldn't have an escort with all those soldiers and horses and spearmen, but this is a Roman citizen, and they are treated different. No Roman citizen was ever allowed to be crucified. If a Roman committed a a crime worthy of capital punishment, they chopped their head off with a sword. There was dignity to how a Roman died. A Roman had rights, and Paul claims his citizenship. And like I say, in this chapter, there's no great doctrines that jump out of us. No real letters of application. Go home and do this. Put this into practice. So how do we conclude? How do we draw from it? For me, I think the lesson is we see God's providence at work. God's providence at work. The word providence is two Latin words, pro and video. Pro and video. Pro means before. Video means to see. I wonder how many of you had video recorders. You put a tape in and on that tape you recorded something that later on you would see. And even today, if you go online and you download a clip, it's called a video clip, even in our digital age, because video means to see. So providence is God going beforehand and arranging circumstances. He sees beforehand. He's able to guide our paths. The hymn writers put it this way, my times are in his hands. My times are in his hands. And that means our good times as well as our bad times. All our experience, God is in control. Let me finish by telling you this story of this incredible lady. Some of you know it. This lady was called Amy Carmichael. She was born in 1867 and she grew up in Ireland. When Amy was a little girl, she begged God. She prayed night after night, God, give me blue eyes. When I look in the mirror, I've got brown eyes and I don't like them. I want beautiful blue eyes. Please, God, give me blue eyes. And you know what? That prayer was never answered. She would look in the mirror constantly 
Come on, God, I'm asking, I'm praying, I'm believing. Where are my blue eyes? They never came. She only ever had brown eyes. She was disappointed. But when she was 16, Amy became a Christian. And when she was aged 28, in 1895, she went to India as a missionary. In India, she was heartbroken when she saw what they call temple children. Temple children. Children who were abandoned, often girls. Indian families didn't want girls, they wanted boys. So if you had a girl, you got rid of her. You abandoned her. And they found refuge in the temple. That's where they got food and water. But as a result, they were treated as prostitutes. Temple prostitutes of the Hindu gods. And when Amy Carmichael saw these girls, she was heartbroken. And she determined she would rescue them and provide sanctuary for them. She described the beautiful Indian children as jewels of the King of Kings. And then she realized why God didn't answer her prayer and give her blue eyes. Because she put coloring on her face to darken, you know, cold tea to make her skin brown. She put a sari on, but if she had blue eyes, the moment she went in the temple, they would stand out and people say, Westerner, they would spot her. But with brown eyes, she looked like any other Indian woman. And she could go into the temple, gather up the children and take them out and provide safety. Providence of God. He doesn't always give us what we want, but he had prepared Amy Carmichael to do a work that would rescue thousands of Indian children from prostitution. Even today, the mission in Donova, in the southern point of India, is still running and is a safe haven for young, abandoned girl. And more than 1,000 children were rescued from neglect, neglect and abuse during Amy's lifetime and not alone. And they called her Amma. Amma, which means mother. And if you want to know the story, there's a video on the shelf in the foyer. A children's version, and I think there's an adult version as well. Do read it. And in her book, Candle in the Dark, she writes these words. Life can be difficult. Sometimes the enemy comes in like a flood. But then is the time to prove our faith. And live our songs. Then is the time to prove our faith and live our songs. And in this chapter, God wants us like Amy and like the Apostle Paul to prove our faith and to sing our songs, whatever our situation. Let's pray. Lord, you put in narrative in your word because we're dealing with real people. In a real world, although in a different time zone. Thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, you know us. You know all about us. You know what we're called to do. You go before us. And we pray, Lord, that you, you will continue to provide for us. Keep us clinging to you, Lord. Whatever our situation. Help us to learn that lesson from Paul and from Amy, we pray. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.